Abiyumi Ezekwe. He is the editor of the Pan-African News Wire, an electronic press agency that was founded in 1998. He has worked for decades in solidarity with the liberation movements and progressive governments on the African continent and the Caribbean. Ezekwe is a graduate of Wayne State University in Detroit, where he earned an undergraduate and graduate degrees in political science, public administration, and educational and administrative studies. He is also the co-founder of several Detroit area organizations, including the Detroit Coalition Against Police Brutality, the Michigan Emergency Committee Against War on Injustice, and the Moratorium Now, Coalition to Stop Foreclosures, Evictions, and Utility Shutoffs. He has worked as a broadcast journalist for the past 12 years and has hosted programs on several radio stations in the U.S. and Canada. He is the author of numerous articles, monographs, and publishing works in, Zimb in the Zimbabwe Herald, the New, Worker, the New Worker in England, The Michigan Citizen, Africa Insight on South Africa, the Center for Research on Globalization in Toronto, and Worker's World, where he, is ser where he currently serves as a contributing editor. He is also the, uh, has also authored chapters in recent books titled Haiti, A Slave Revolution, and Gaza, Symbol of Resistance. And I recommend both of those to you. Thank you very much, uh, Sister Debbie. I want to uh, also thank uh, all of the organizations uh, that came together to put on this very, very important panel today. Uh, people who came from around the country. Uh, this is very, very significant and hopefully out of this event, we'll be able to continue our work against uh, repression here in the United States of America. Now, this forum today is very important because it links the century-old racist policies implemented by the United States against Native Americans, against African Americans, against Latinos, and other oppressed nations with the escalation and repression against Muslims, immigrants, and international solidarity activists. It is essential during this period that these struggles against repression and for freedom of speech and association are brought together under one umbrella. What we need more than ever in the United States is a broad-based alliance to fight the excesses of government interference in the affairs of oppressed and minority groups. It is the job of the ruling class inside this country to divide and conquer each group separately and to deny that there is a concerted plan to escalate coercive mechanisms that further exploitation of the majority of the people in the United States and around the world. In fact, the domestic policy of a particular country or a particular state is always reflected in its foreign policy. This is profoundly illustrated in the current period where the repression against Muslims, immigrants, African Americans and others are utilized to justify imperialist wars in Central Asia, in the Middle East, in Africa, as well as Latin America. It is no accident that intense conflicts initiated by the U.S. are being carried out against countries that have predominantly Muslim populations and people of color. This war is also going on inside the United States against these same oppressed groups who have historically been subjected to racism, exploitation, and state repression. Almost every week, the corporate media in the United States reveals another purported, quote, terrorist plot, unquote, that always seems to involve Muslims. This is done without any real motivation being cited other than the hatred towards the values and institutions of this country. What is also significant about the ongoing roundup of Muslims in the United States is that the corporate media does not draw any parallels between the plight of the Islamic community and that of immigrants, African Americans, and social activists. All of these constituencies are under increasing levels of repression. Inside the United States, approximately 2.5 million people are incarcerated in prisons and in jails. <clears throat> In addition, millions more are under the supervision of some law enforcement agency, some public institution, or some school system. Schools are being turned into prisons, as well as neighborhoods, where people are encouraged to become informants to the police 
and other repressive entities. Now, with, with specific regard to the African American people, the legacy of slavery is very much a part of the overall social fabric of the United States. Between 1619 and 1865, millions of Africans were enslaved by the British and the Americans here in North America. The enslavement of Africans in the United States was not only given legal sanction, but it was pivotal in building this country into the largest and most powerful industrial state in the world. As African American historian and social scientist W.E.B. Du Bois noted in his seminal work entitled Black Reconstruction in America, quote, the giant forces of water and of steam were harnessed to do the world's work, and the work of black workers of America bent at the bottom of a growing pyramid of commerce and industry, and they not only could not be spared, if this new economic organization was to expand, but rather they became the cause of new political demands and alignments, of new dreams of power and visions of empire, unquote. Du Bois also pointed out that, quote, black labor became the foundation stone not only of the southern social structure, but of northern manufacture and commerce, of the English factory system, of European commerce, of buying and selling on a worldwide scale. New cities were built as a result of black labor. And a, new for, and a new labor problem involving all white labor arose, both in Europe as well as North America." Unquote. Now in the aftermath of slavery, which took a four-year bloody civil war to end between 1861 and 1865, the country's leaders failed to reconstruct democracy based on full equality and self-determination for the African-American people. Immediately after the Civil War, the Ku Klux Klan and other racist organizations were formed in an attempt to put blacks back into slavery. With the withdrawal of the federal troops from the South after the elections of 1876, the court of Judge Lynch became the order of the day. Between the 1880s and the Great Depression of the 1930s, at least 5,000 Africans were lynched inside the United States. These repressive measures were reinforced with draconian laws that institutionalized the subordination of African people to the white-dominated ruling class in this country. Segregation was carried out in order to better refine the system of labor exploitation of both African-American and white workers and farmers. It was in the social, it's within this social context that the first internationally renowned movement against repression was given birth. The struggle was spearheaded by Ida B. Wells Barnett, who was born in, in one of the most repressive states in the country, Mississippi, during the Civil War. She would later move to Memphis, Tennessee to become a journalist and an educator. Due to racist repression, Wells Barnett was fired from her teaching job, and eventually the newspaper she started had its office in Memphis ordered closed by a racist judge and firebombed in 1893. She would travel throughout the U.S. and the U.K. during the 1890s, spreading the gospel on the need to build a movement against repression. Moving up to World War I, there was an escalation in racist repression against African Americans. In 1917, a group of black servicemen in Houston, Texas, were fired upon by a white mob. The African American soldiers returned fire and were later arrested and court-martialed, resulting in 12 of them being hanged by the U.S. military. Wells Barnett set out to organize protests against this travesty of justice. She developed a button that criticized the U.S. military for its actions. She was later visited by agents of the government and ordered to stop circulating the buttons or be arrested. In her autobiography entitled Crusade for Justice, Wells Barnett recounted the encounter with the Secret Service agent saying, quote, I'd rather go down in history as one lone Negro who dared to tell the government that he had done a dastardly thing than to save my skin by taking back what I have said. I would consider it a horror to spend whatever years are necessary in prison as one member of the race who protested against, uh, that protested rather than to be all those 12 million blacks who didn't go to prison because they kept their mouths shut, unquote. Between the years leading up to World War I and the 1960s, millions of African Americans migrated from the South to the North and the West of the United States. 
This is noted in one of the greatest movements in any industrialized state which resulted from the determination of an oppressed people to seek freedom. Nonetheless, the conditions prevailing in the cities for African Americans were just as bad, if not worse, than those in the rural areas of the South. The realization sparked the development of many social movements aimed at self-determination and social emancipation. For the purpose of the short period in which we are examining these issues today, let us put a human face on the role of repression meted out by the United States government and the corporate community designed to keep the African American people in these same oppressive conditions. We can talk about Hubert Harrison, the writer, the orator, and organizer who was born in the Danish-controlled Caribbean island of St. Croix, which was later purchased by the United States during World War I. Harrison migrated to the U.S. during the first decade of the 20th century and plunged into social movements that challenged the powers that be during the period. His outspoken efforts as a radical resulted in him losing his job with the Postal Service, crippling his ability to earn a decent living. Harrison was an orator of legendary proportions and served as an organizer for various organizations including the Socialist Party, the Garvey Movement, among others. We can also look at Marcus Garvey, born in the Caribbean island of Jamaica. He came to the United States in 1916 to raise funds to build an industrial school for Africans in that former British colony. He would eventually work with the people such as Hubert Harrison and build the largest mass movement to date in the United States. In order to curb his influence, Garvey was arrested and framed on mail fraud charges and would spend two years in prison before he was deported from the United States in 1927. It was the FBI founder and director, J. Edgar Hoover, who would gain his reputation for undermining the, Gar the Garvey, uh, Marcus Garvey and his movement. We could also look at Claudia Jones, the brilliant woman who was born in Trinidad and migrated to the United States, where she became involved in radical movements. She became a journalist and a leading theoretician on the race and gender questions of the day. She is credited for developing the notion of the triple oppression of African American women, which took the national class and gender subordination of black women into consideration in formulating a program of struggle. Jones was investigated by the FBI during the 1930s and 40s, and eventually she was arrested on immigration violations. She would later uh, be a defendant in the 1951 Smith Act trials, purportedly for conspiring to violently overthrow the United States government. She was imprisoned again for a year and deported to England in 1955, where she died 10 years later. Shirley Graham Dubois, a playwright, a biographer, a theoretician, and an organizer. She was the second wife of Dr. W.B. Du Bois. Her efforts would prove instrumental in, in helping W.B. Du Bois avoid prison when he was over 80 years old here in the United States. However, the couple's passports were confiscated between 1950 and 1958, and consequently they could not travel outside the United States. The Du Bois would take up citizenship in Ghana under Kwame Nkrumah in 1960, where W.E.B. Du Bois would die in 1963 at the age of 95. Shirley Graham Du Bois would become director of Ghana National Television between 1964 and 1966, when a reactionary military and police coup backed by the Central Intelligence Agency overthrew the government of President Kwame Nkrumah. Du Bois had her U.S. citizenship revoked in the early 1960s and was not allowed to re-enter the United States until 1970. She would eventually take up residence in Egypt and China where she died in 1976. Malcolm X, El Haj Malik El Shabazz, is known as one of the greatest orators of the African American struggle that emerged during the 1950s and 1960s. He was the national spokesman for the Nation of Islam until 1963 when he was forced out of the organization. In 1964, his trips abroad in Africa and the Middle East would attract the attention of the FBI and other intelligence agencies. Malcolm was assassinated on February 21, 1965, and many believe that the federal government was behind his death. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., known as the charismatic spokesman of the Civil Rights Movement, and the co-founder of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, King was subjected to years of government harassment and vilification. In 1964, prior to receiving the Nobel Peace Prize, the FBI tried to blackmail him into committing suicide. 
When King took a strong position against the U.S. military involvement in Vietnam in 1967, he was completely isolated from the federal government. He was gunned down in Memphis on April 4th of 1968. Angela Davis, a scholar and an activist, Davis was fired from the University of California in 1970 for being a member of the Communist Party. Soon after this, she would be charged with conspiracy to liberate George Jackson from prison and would serve two years in solitary confinement. Her trial in 1972 ended in acquittal, and she is today an outspoken advocate of prison reform and women's rights. She is a survivor of the turbulent struggle for African American liberation. Asada Shakur, a former member of the Black Panther Party, Shakur was driven underground in 1971 and was nearly killed in a shootout with the police in 1973 in New Jersey. She would spend six years in prison before escaping and being granted political asylum in the revolutionary Caribbean island nation of Cuba. And finally, Imam Lukman Amin Abdullah. Bringing this right home to Detroit, the assassination of Imam Lukman was one of the gravest crimes of the modern era. An Imam at the Masjid El Haq, he would work for years rehabilitating juvenile delinquents, former prison inmates, and providing food and shelter to the poor and the homeless on the west side of Detroit. His mosque was infiltrated by the FBI and its informants. In October of 2009, he was lured along with other members of his mosque to an FBI-created fake warehouse in neighboring Dearborn. After having a vicious police dog set upon him, he was shot 20 times by FBI agents who had been trained at the Counterterrorism Training Center in Quantico, Virginia. A subsequent federal investigation exonerated the agents involved in the assassination. His death came amid a wave of repression against Muslims and other oppressed groups inside the United States. In closing, I would just like to point out, all of these specific cases of government repression leveled against the African American community points to the necessity of building a broad-based alliance of progressive forces to tackle law enforcement with suppression and brutality. This aspect of the struggle for human freedom and decency is imperative if we are to advance the movement towards social justice into the new realm that is, is required in the current period. Before we leave here today, let us make a commitment to work together to end these various forms of government repression. We owe this to our ancestors and to our future generations. Thank you so much.